Today's worship is dedicated to all who are lamenting the revelations of this year's epiphany regarding the state of our union. And all who, because of this lament, more boldly say yes to the courageous, perpetual call of truth, justice, and becoming. Good morning. I am Reverend Denise Bender. I am the associate pastor, part of the pastoral team at Cameron. Today on this Sunday follows an un follows unprecedented violence at our Capitol that has taken our shared experience to a new and tragic place. As Christians, it's important for us to lend our voices to the thousands of other voices that lament today. Our hearts get pulverized in this fallen world. Lament is usually narrowly defined as a synonym for grieving or grumbling. Yet biblical lament, as seen in the Psalms, is characterized by an expression of trust in the character, the power, and previous actions of God. Psalm 42 provides a good example of the confusion in lament, articulating a struggle with depression and misunderstanding. The psalmist cries, my tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. This reveals a heart struggling with pain, offering fears and doubts to God and longing for a renewal of spirit. Laments announce aloud and publicly what is wrong right now. Laments create room within the individual and the community, not only for shared grief and loss, but also for seeing and naming injustice. L Laments name the weeping and fracturing of relationships, personal, political, domestic, ecclesial, national, and global. The point of lamenting is to name injustice, hurt, and anger. Lament is not despair. It is not whining. It is not a cry into the void. Lament is a cry directed to God. It is the cry of those who seek the seek the truth of the world's deep wounds and the cost of seeking peace. It is the prayer of those who are deeply disturbed by the way things are. In naming injustice, lament serves as a form of prophecy, speaking God's truth to the world. Hear these laments from the Psalms. In the days of her affliction and wandering, Jerusalem remembers all the treasures that were hers in days of old. When her people fell into enemy hands, there was no one to help her. Her enemies looked at her and laughed at her destruction. I called on your name, Lord, from the depths of the pit. You heard my plea, do not close your ears to my cry for relief. You came near when I called you and you said, do not fear. We are invited into a time of lament for this particular time in history, for our leadership, for ourselves. Lamenting is lifting those reflections of pain, confusion, and anger. This is a time to speak the pain, confusion, and anger into the space, into a space that will be safe. There are no answers in lament, but there is freedom. There are no regrets in lament, but our own truths. Laments are acts of faith that give us the opportunity to ask open-ended questions that we speak to life. We will continue to struggle with seemingly impossible answers as God guides us 
to realize the great potential that we have for change. I invite you now to lament, uh, unmute, and we'll call on you, and then we will close this time with prayer. But now is the time to be able to speak your laments. We have a recently elected representative from the Western Slope who's made headlines by wanting to wear a sidearm openly into the state capitol. I am a gun owner and a proponent of the Second Amendment, but I would remind those who think this way that the right to keep and bear arms does not mean that keeping and bearing arms makes you right. I, I am angry and confused on why it is so difficult for people to just wear a mask and the stress and the, the, the frustrations this is causing our health workers, paramedics, nurses, respiratory therapists, the office staff that checks patients in and they're exhausted and they're dying and people just won't wear a mask. I am wailing um, about the absolute outright white supremacy visions that we saw. And I know it's all over the news, but to realize, to realize at such a deep level that if those were black and brown faces, the body count would be beyond what we could even imagine. It's in our face. I'm very, I don't even have a word for it, but I'm very troubled by the fact that it is going to be so extremely difficult to hold the current president accountable for anything. Um, even if we can accomplish a peach impeachment, I would be happy for that because it would prevent him from ever running for any office again. But a big part of the reason about what happened is that he's been able to lie for so long and to cheat people for so long. And he's been enabled for so long and no one wants to hold him accountable. And I do believe that in the center of himself, he is totally unaware that there's anything good within him, which is extremely tragic for him. But it's also, you can see what kind of destruction that does. So that's my lament. My lament, I have many. How can people use religion to justify totally horrible behavior and claim it to be Jesus? How can anybody without a heart still support the current president? How can so many Republicans enable him? And why do people keep sending those same senators back to offices beyond me? It's mind boggling. Thank you. It sickens me to hear the word patriot thrown about with the people that uh, stormed the Capitol on uh, Tuesday. Uh, I, I, I look at that and I go, you, you hear about the words about the American Revolution and it was done to overthrow a tyrant and establish a government uh, of, of the people and by the people and for the people. And here are these people were fomenting revolution to keep a tyrant in place and in power and to destroy the very fabric and meaning of our system of government. It just boggles my mind, it has made me sad, angry, and frustrated that we have gotten to this point in society. And that should scare all of us because these are people speaking against freedom and for uh, autocracy and fascism. So I am totally confused because I understand how I feel 
and why I think everything that happened was wrong. Yet I hear from relatives who are on the other side and they feel with equal fervency that they are 100% right. And that what happened was justified and maybe not appropriate, but was understandable. And it scares me at how we will ever be able to come together when we are so far apart. I lament today um, over the fact that privilege and justice and inequality reign strongly in our nation. Uh, in 2013, Miriam Carey, a woman with a baby in her car, turned wrong into the Capitol and was shot down and killed, shot 13 times. And we have over 100 people who were allowed to walk into the Capitol, and the lady didn't get close to the steps. And we see this on television, and we don't question how white supremacy just reigns and rules over our nation. So. I am just totally distraught with those scenes. My lament is for the, the Constitution and the idea of the rule of law that justifies the many wrongs and harms that are caused when we misinterpret them without ever hearing the number one rule of law today is to love God, to love ourselves, and to love others. Right now, it's easy to throw our heads to look to the heavens and ask why is an ongoing lament. But I think we have to start turning that word inward with each other to seek truth. I know everyone has an opinion, but an uninformed opinion is really just a rant. And it saddens me and sickens me that too many people are willing to take an easy meme instead of seeking truth. I'm very saddened by what I see in the future of the increasing us versus them of the ruling class. In other words, all of this is gonna cause more security measures at all of our public institutions and uh, places of public gathering. Um, and it's going to make uh, people who make the laws barricaded away from the people who have to live with those laws. and. I just, I see this in our future and it's very sad. And I still cannot believe that someone who says that they love and admire and respect everyone in the country, encourage people to get on planes and do this as a huge super spreader event. I'm so sad about that. Um, I don't know if I'm the only one who feels this way. I don't feel sad. I feel angry. Um, I'm really tired of uh, even Lauren Brobart, our new congressperson that went on Wednesday and objected to um, free and fair elections, said the next day that people who are calling for the 25th Amendment or impeachment um, are being disingenuous when we talk about being united. And I'm tired that it's always us that are being asked to reach across the aisle. I'm tired that it's us that are trying to, um, that are always being asked to be forgiving, to be understanding of the quote unquote plight of, um, you know, these white folks. We're the ones that are supposed to be loving while they can foment hate and act on it. So um, my lament is like, I, I have lost, room in my heart right now for love and peace and patience. I'm just pissed. My heart has been breaking over and over. It broke when my daughter removed herself from my life almost a year ago. And it broke with the pandemic. It 
continues to break and it continues to break. There's something about the family that didn't work and something about the family of our country, which is so broken and the family of our earth, which is there to sustain us all. And I don't know what to do. And so I feel broken. Yes, I was um, born and raised in Washington, D.C. And back in uh, the days when I was younger in high school, we would uh, go down to the Capitol and you could walk in, you could sit in the galleries of the House and Senate. Um, you could observe what was going on in our country and get a sense that you were connected with it. And so much of that has been taken away with from us. And um, I'm, I'm really saddened on the attack on the Capitol because of what it stands for. And yet at the same time, I know that um, we'll grow from this. It's gonna to be tough growth, but, but we will survive. And hopefully uh, we'll get smarter about our choices and, and who we believe in. I too lament that all of these folks are doing all of these atrocities in the name of Christ. And it's really not Christ they're worshiping. They're worshiping the almighty dollar. Plain and simple. Because Christ would have been doing exactly the opposite Christ would have been saying, hey, let's feed these poor people. Let's, you know, let's heal the sick. Not be so entitled that we have to go out and make everybody sick. You know, it just, yeah. Just saying. Our ancient wisdom this morning comes to us from the books of John and Romans. From the third chapter of John, we hear, Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. And from Romans, therefore I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. Good morning, Cameron. I cannot tell you how good it is to be in community with you this morning. Before I begin, I, I, I want to say thank you to Pastor Denise and Mary for answering the call to lead us in lament this morning. We all felt that we just could not do worship as usual this week, that we needed to respond to the human condition. I also want to express gratitude to Marty for her patience with me this week, particularly with the Thursday e-blast. Um, because after Wednesday, my mental and emotional capacity was just delayed. And I, re I remember being on the phone with Marty talking about the e-blast uh, and agreeing to wait for her to send it to me and hung up the phone and completely forgot that the e-blast was coming. So thank you, Marty. 
Now for all who may be our special guest today for the first time, I am Reverend Dr. Valerie L. Jackson, preferably known as PJ or Pastor Jackson. And I have the awesome privilege of being the lead pastor of the wonderful community known as Cameron United Methodist Church. And it is my great joy to have you with us on this very sacred day of worship and lament. Epiphany, to be born again. That is the title and, and the direction of our homily today. I think maybe we thought it could not get worse than COVID. But wow, were we wrong. And Cameron, our nation will never be the same. We, the Cameron community, will never be the same. January 6, 2021, forever changed our lives. Much like the change we experienced on Tuesday, September 11th, 2001, beginning at 8.46 a.m. Eastern time. But this time, it was domestic uh, terrorism. A crowd of angry Trump supporters assaulted our nation's capital to disregard and overthrow our democracy, to steal our republic, by disrupting a very basic tenet of our constitution, which is the certification and completion of the electoral process and honoring the voice and the will of the people regarding the presidential election. Our legacy of a peaceful transfer of power was stained. We witnessed in real time the desecration of our capital by a predominantly white, angry group of Trump supporters. They broke through the metal and human perimeters, busted through the windows and doors, while others seemingly were just invited in. They ran the entire scope of the capital. They were on the dais, they were in the gallery, they were on the governing floor, they were in the hallways and the offices of our representatives. We saw pictures of these rioters proudly sitting in the office and the chair of the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, feet up on her desk reading and stealing her mail and leaving written threats. There were pictures of even someone smiling and profiling and proudly stealing the speaker's podium. We saw pictures of frightened and praying governing representatives, pictures of Capitol Police officers taking selfies with the assailants, the terrorists. Pictures of Capitol Police officers gently escorting the assailants in and out of the building and assisting those who had been tear gassed. Not that police officers shouldn't be compassionate. It was actually good to see that they can be compassionate, but these visuals juxtapose to the Black Lives Matter protests reveal a truth of our nation. There were pictures of a lynching stage constructed in the mall between Lincoln Memorial and the Capitol and Confederate flags raised in the halls, both being symbols of white supremacy, again, revealing, revealing a truth of our nation. Reports also say that urine and feces were left behind in the offices of our elected officials. 
So to see pictures of the night staff, largely persons of color and representatives of color cleaning up the mess left behind by an angry group of white supremacists revealed and reminded us of a truth about our nation that also compounded assault and trauma on the souls of persons of color who live with ancestral memories of forced and violent servitude and current day assaults of disrespect and unworthiness every day. And all of this, and this is not the whole list of things that we saw, but all of this was seemingly invited and welcomed by the president of the United States. In fact, there is a video of the president instructing this crowd to go to the Capitol and fight. There is also a video of the president and his family and supporters having a watch party, enjoying the execution of this insurrection. There is also a video of the president telling the crowd of domestic terrorists, I love you. Now I celebrate and I welcome unconditional love. I believe we heard Dudley say earlier that, that our first law as Christ-centered people is to love God with all our heart, mind, and soul, to love ourselves and then to love our neighbors. So I celebrate unconditional and uncensored love. But the problem I have with it is I had never heard the president say I love you to anyone else in the four years of his presidency. In all of the hurt and harm that we've experienced in the last four years, not at his hand necessarily, but I never heard him say to hurting parents whose sons and daughters come, came home dead, I love you. I never heard him say to veterans who have served in, pro in previous wars, I love you. I never heard him say to the families of George Floyd or Breonna Taylor, I love you. After this week, some Americans were in shock, saying we looked like a third world country. Some Americans were in shock, saying we look like the countries that we have condemned and demanded democracy of. Some Americans were in shock, declaring that this just, re this just did not look like America. However, as a woman who is black and queer, I dare say that it looked exactly like America. It looked like the America that I and other marginalized and oppressed folk know and experience every day. This America had come to the surface for everyone to see. Television had done it again, revealing the sins of America for everyone to see, just as it did in the days of Jim Crow. My Cameron family, this day that was so painful, this Wednesday, January 6, 2021, was epiphany a day of showing, a day of revealing or being made known. The evils that lurk in the shadows were brought to the forefront. Evils that have the privilege of hiding in whiteness, not in darkness, in whiteness. 
were suddenly on a worldwide stage and we could no longer deny it. Again, as a woman who is black and queer, my feelings were all over the place. I was horrified just as you. I was shocked just as you, but perhaps unlike you, I was experiencing PTSD as these visuals triggered all of my painful experiences as a black woman in America. But I also felt a sense of exoneration because here was proof, proof of the white supremacy, white privilege that we, the oppressed, talk about, write about, and sing about, but very few believe. Now, obviously, I could go on and on about the ugliness of this day, but Cameron, much of it would be preaching to the choir. So instead, let's think about how this day of epiphany reveals the ways in which this insurgency was not just committed by the angry white supremacists on the Capitol grounds. In other words, as Marty said, and Marty, I have to wonder if you peeped my sermon today, let us dare to lament further, deeper, by asking ourselves some very uncomfortable but brave questions. For example, how are we complicit in what happened on that day? How are we complicit with what happened on this day? Why do we refuse to see America for who or what it is? How can we possibly be shocked by what we saw? Do we not remember the America that was stolen from the Native Americans? Do we not remember slavery and the Jim Crow era? Do we not remember the multitude of lynchings and burnings that have happened right here in this country? Do we not remember the masses of people that live in poverty, that live on the streets? Do we not remember the Stonewall riot? The many who have died because they dare to tell the truth about who they are. So how can we possibly be shocked? How is it that this underbelly of hatred thrives in America, a place that declares liberty and freedom for all? What is the difference between this angry mob on Wednesday and our elected officials, such as Mitch McConnell, Lindsey Graham, Josh Hawley, Ted Cruz, and so many others, or even those in our families, in our workplaces, and Cameron, even in our churches. What is the difference between the assault we witnessed on Wednesday and the daily assaults of disrespect and passive aggressions hurled at people who are different every day? 
I'm talking about black and indigenous people of color. I'm talking about women. I'm talking about people with special needs, people who are not heteronormative and people who are able differently. I said to you earlier that I, or, or I asked us earlier, what is the difference between what happened on Wednesday and what happens in our churches? And, and I wonder, do you know what happens in our churches? Do you, do you know that I was once at a church that if they did not agree with the decision I made, they withheld my paycheck? Do you know that there are some churches that our bishop have, has gone to that have met her with guns on their laps. And we are surprised. Why do we constantly excuse those who commit these assaults on others by saying they mean well, they are good people. Why do we continue to fraternize with those who commit these assaults on others without loving them enough to hold them accountable? As Debbie said, why is it those who are perpetuated upon continually asked to be the ones to cross the aisles, to be patient, to wait. Why are we just realizing the plight of the oppressed? Why do we not already know the lived experiences of our sibling humans? In short, my Cameron family, I am asking each and every one of us, all of us, including me, to ask ourselves, how is it that we can behave in white supremacist ways and not identify as white supremacists? I wrestled with these questions this week and I was convicted by these questions this week and the conviction compelled me to share a message on Facebook that I want to share with you now. This message said, my God, my God, we America allowed this to happen. This did not just begin four years ago. This very sad but most authentic witness of who America really is, is a culmination of generations of unchecked white supremacy and privilege. It is conservatives plotting to maintain the status quo. It is progressives guarding our privilege while half-heartedly fighting the fight of justice. It is all of us being silent and turning a blind eye to so much harm. It is me and my colleagues failing to preach prophetic truths, failing to address, it is all of us failing to address the hatefulness in our family members, our friends and our coworkers. It is all of us refusing to engage in courageous conversations, declaring that people are good and mean well while they aggressively and passively aggressively de dehumanize and destroy others. It is all of us imposing the onus of civility and waiting on the oppressed and refusing to call out and reject the American lie, the American illusion. For America has never been who it says it is.
my Cameron family, we have lots of work to do. Debbie, get ready. Good trouble at Cameron. We, we have lots of work to do. And I believe the paths to answering these questions are in our sacred wisdom today. Both scriptures of, sac of sacred text cause us to birth and rebirth. We are born into one reality and we have no control over that. We had no control over being born as Americans. We had no control over being born into a colonized paradigm. We had no control over that. We had no control over being taught the binary gender identity of women and men. We had no control over being taught that heteronormativity is the only right sexual orientation. We had no right, we had no control over being taught that white is supreme and that all else is inferior or that male is supreme and all else is inferior. We had no control over that. So it's no need for any of us to feel guilty or shame for being born into America. However, it is our human and our Christ-centered responsibility to seek and experience rebirths, to be born again throughout our life's journey. We should constantly and continuously wake up to awareness, self-awareness, family awareness, community awareness, national awareness, and global awareness that will ultimately result in a renewal of our thinking, a renewal of our language, a renewal of our behaviors and our practices. I believe this is what some of you are asking for when you say, can, can not our government begin to see a new way of being? Maybe, maybe we need to begin to look beyond a two-party system of Republicans and Democrats. Obviously the answer is not in who rules the Congress or who rules the Senate. It's not the answer. It hasn't been the answer since the inception of our constitution and our government. If it were the answer, we would already be a better American. If we were to be born again continuously with the changing of who we are, it would ultimately result in an alternative nation, an alternative world, an alternative way of being that would ultimately exemplify the beloved community. A community where all of creation is at the center and not a community where whiteness, maleness, and heteronormativity and able-bodiedness welcomes everyone else in. This is our call. Our call is to be born again. And in that, born, in that being born again, we produce thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. My siblings, we must reclaim the word or the phrase that our evangelical conservative siblings have misused and abused. We must be born again. We reclaim it. Being born again is not a one-time event as evangelicals have proclaimed. It is not a one-time event that assures us the gift of going to heaven as opposed to going to hell. Being born again is a perpetual activity, a continuous activity that would give us the authority and the power and the wisdom and the insight to create the beloved community. Being born again 
is indeed the very meaning of epiphany. And once we have experienced epiphany, which is revelation, once we have seen, once we have come into knowledge, we can never be the same again. We cannot unsee, we cannot unknow. But unfortunately, as, as history has proven, we can choose to lay revealed truths aside and do nothing to further change or the manifestation of beloved community. But I pray Cameron that this will not be our choice. I pray that we will choose to be born again and to usher in the newness of the kingdom of heaven. Now, Cameron, let us go forth on the journey of being born again, on the journey of renewal, on the journey of beloved community. Now may the grace of God and the sweet communion of God's Holy Spirit rest, rule and abide with each and every one of us. Until we meet again, let us all say together, our men, our women, Ashe, namaste.